Well, welcome to another new edition of the LFMA Spot and Forward uh, platform where we interview interesting people from all around the world in terms of what is going on in financial markets in Luxembourg, in Europe, internationally, everything that's happening here is of interest for our members and we're very particularly happy to have today Vincenzo Di Masi with us, one of the preeminent figures when it comes to financial markets, both in Luxembourg, in Italy, but also internationally. Um, first question, obviously, is who is Vincenzo Di Masi? He's the Global Sales uh, Strategy and Execution Director for Refinitiv, particularly in charge of uh, foreign exchange trading, post-trade and compliance. And when we're talking about interesting topics, well, today we've got a treat for you. We're talking about a topic which is increasingly important when it comes to how we deal with communications in a modern world, in a transitioning world. Everything is changing. The way we communicate is increasingly uh, changing. And, well, that's also the case for financial markets, I guess. The way we interact in financial markets between the different actors, between the traders, between the employees, that's increasingly changing. We're using different apps, we're using different tools, whether that's uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, WhatsApp, SMS, emails, obviously. All of those means of communications, electronic means of communications, are an integral part of, of how financial markets operate today and, and how trades are done or information is exchanged. And so for financial markets operators, it is obviously increasingly important to understand what tools, what means their employees are using, how they are using it, and for what purpose they're using it. So it's definitely a challenge for financial market operators, uh, both on, on the trading side, but also on, on just the operations side to keep track of, of what's going on, how it's going on, and um, also monitoring what, what, what is in terms of content being exchanged through uh, electronic communication. And obviously, once you have to monitor this, it's also a question of, in, in terms of quality and quantity, can you manage to, uh, to monitor it, how you monitor it, and thereby detecting potential misbehaviors, wrong behaviors, things that are not so good, and things that are good. So that's, that's an, an, an increasing challenge that, that banks and, and other investment firms have to, to deal with on, on a daily basis. Um, and at the same time, obviously, regulators are getting increasingly interested in uh, how firms are actually managing this, this challenge. And uh, we've seen in Luxembourg, enforcements are on the rise. It's certainly no, uh, no off topic anymore for the CSSF to impose sanctions on, on firms that mis misbehave. We've seen other banks uh, being, uh, being targeted by, by regulatory uh, sanctions all around the world. And I think when we look at history, there's probably one big story that, that, that was the kickstart of this entire discussion, namely uh, the rigging of, of the LIBOR. Uh, that was sort of the beginning of when we realized that communication between traders has a lot of potential to identify breaches, identify misbehavior, and identify also where things can go massively wrong in terms of, of how, uh, how communications are being used. Now, obviously, with remote working still being around a lot and probably being here to, to stay for good, teleworking, um, and then also the, the, the technological advances that we see, whether that's in terms of machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, all of these elements combined make the surveillance or the monitoring of electronic communication a hot topic that we see today being on the rise. And it's definite, it, it's very clear that we're on, on a hot topic here that's going to be increasingly important, whether that's through regulation, but also in the very interest of, of firms themselves to, uh, to find out what is going on in terms of electronic communication. And, and I think I'm, I'm sort of opening the discussion with Vincenzo here. Um, so how do you see how electronic communications have evolved through the years? I guess you've seen an increased usage, that, that, that's a no-brainer. But also, how relevant has electronic communications become for financial markets? I guess that's also something where you've seen a development to more and more and more. 
Yeah, thanks, Jill. Uh, I think you, you touched some very interesting topics and very well described the, the current scenario with the opportunities to improve workflows, but also the challenges that we need to, to take care of because of these developments. Uh, yes, if we look back five to 10 years ago, the way we communicate, the way we work, the way we interact on our professional, but also private life has really changed a lot. And there are several vectors that, that drove this change, basically. Definitely volume, right, is the first one. Uh, we, we exchange a lot more information. There is almost unlimited storage capability. We really don't care about the size of the attachments anymore compared to a few years ago. The second vector is velocity. We do it faster. Uh, we use a variety of systems and tools and electronic communication channels, generating both fragmentation, but also um, there is one element which is very important to mention, which is the detachment from asynchronous ways and methods of communication like email and the full adoption of more synchronous systems. And so we need to be aware of the status of our counterparty. We need to be aware if they read our message. And this generates velocity, speed. And the other component that we already mentioned to some extent is variety, right? Um, we all have at least five to 10 apps on our mobiles to interact with each other. Parents, uh, families, con customers, counterparties, and we can download an app and register into a new messaging system in a few seconds. All of these determines a huge fragmentation of the communication channels that we can use. And this is already an area of focus and a point of attention when you try to move those uh, trends into the world of the financial markets. The last vector is vulnerability, or if you prefer security, which was, has always been and will be a paramount for us. But obviously, with the pandemic triggering new behaviors, the hybrid working, the working from home using personal devices for professional workflows, there is an interesting area to discover and to analyze. Now, volume, velocity, variety, vulnerability. If you try to transpose these into the financial market workflows, this really generates some additional operational uh, conduct compliance, and ultimately reputational risks to take care of. And mm, I would say that recently some investigations and some fines that hit some of the primary um, uh, participants to the financial market raised the attention uh, about, about this topic. The attention of regulators is very clear, is rising. And definitely this is something that keeps compliance teams, but also head of trading awake and with a little bit more of a focus required to better manage the new challenges which are arising from the way we use new channels of communications. So oh, let me jump in. You mentioned something very, very interesting there. With this whole record keeping, I guess that, that, that's quite intrusive also for employees and, and, and for the actual traders when, when all of their messages are being tracked and monitored. Because obviously there's, the, the, there's this mix that you mentioned between private messages, um, professional messages, and then also trade-specific messages, all of that being together. And I guess in, in the Luxembourg context, I would like to add a, another layer on that. In, in Luxembourg, we're, we're a multicultural melting pot. So you have different cultures coming together, different languages. Um, I guess all of us know the, the Franklish that, that is so specific of Luxembourgish, this mixture between French and, and English uh, that, that a lot of us uh, speak. And then um, I guess that, that there needs to be a sort of measure of nuance in terms of what messages are actually relevant and, and where it's so important to, uh, to, to, to understand in, in terms of linguistics, in terms of, of also personal messages, but what is important, and, and I guess that, that this privacy angle is, is quite key, and, and you sort of already alluded to it, but I just wanted to, to jump in and, and bring this, this, this Luxembourg nuance into it. Yeah, you raise a very interesting point, Shield, because obviously when it, it's about rec doing the record keeping and storing the messages and monitoring, there's a lot about the analytics you use. We are entering a world of a new, um, uh, a new approach into this. We're moving from systematic passive archiving 
just in case something happens, I have the tools to react, let's say to an investigation from a regulator or an authority. We're moving into a new paradigm where the, there is active monitoring and there is the ability given by technology to recognize patterns and potentially recognize dangerous conduct scenarios in advance. Technology plays an important role in doing this, recognizing languages, dividing the set of messages so that, it, that those could be assigned to different compliance teams in your organization to deal exactly with those language nuances you mentioned too. Another point you raised was the, uh, the mix of channels we used, this fragmentation, and the opportunity that mixing uh, professional trading uh, chats and conversations um, with known professional, at some point we may end up with sensible private data being collected through those channels. And as we all know, uh, uh, in, in all, almost all jurisdictions there are rules around privacy data. We can take GDPR as an example in Europe and nobody wants to uh, get trapped uh, by, by Th those rules, those regulations, and the fines associated uh, into that. Another interesting point is that uh, sometimes we tend to think this is a, a need coming and stemming out mainly from a trading floor. But if you think about it, the use cases for this, the, the risk scenarios that the financial market in a wider definition can face, can be recognized also in different scenarios and with different counterparties is not just financial counterparties. Think about a corporate uh, operating in a more bribery-prone jurisdiction. Uh, think about the importance of understanding if my employees uh, are interacting with counterparties which are subject to list of sanctions or uh, mm, I need to avoid the fact that they can and possibly have interacted with a specific list of people. Uh, that they should not be in touch with. So it's financial, it's non-financial, and it's also uh, important that some other departments can be interested into these. HR, uh, legal departments, if you think about litigations uh, that mm, need to be investigated, right, you need to have the data. And considering that fragmentation uh, across different channels, it's important to have the right technology in place to leverage all of those data for two reasons. One, you want to be fast in responding to your uh, actions and activities and, and completing your investigations. You want to be fast and in responding to regulators, reg regulators and authorities and provide them with the data with a single click uh, in, in a matter of minutes and not collecting data from different uh, silos, databases that you need to interact with and generate a solution for them. And being able to respond faster in an investigation process already positioned differently uh, in, in that flow of activities. Yeah, no, that's, that's very interesting. Now, as, as a lawyer by training, um, one question I, I immediately had in, in mind when I saw just the generic topic that we're going to talk about today is well, monitoring is, is all fine, but you need to have a proper legal basis, obviously, for that. And I think regulatory authorities have been very, very good at lobbying the, the legislator into giving a legislative framework that suits them very well into getting what they need. And I think, the, sort of, for me, the prime example is always MIFID. MIFID has been the bane of my existence since I started as a lawyer in, in financial markets. And, and certainly MIFID II with this record keeping um, requirement is, 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 is a prime example as to what you need to do as a financial firm or for a firm active in financial markets to keep track of, of what you're doing, how you're doing it, with whom you're doing it. All of that is, is, is englobed in, uh, in MIFID II. But there are also other pieces of legislation um, such as market abuse regulation, I guess that, that that's also another big topic, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, these these sort of fringe cases where, where things went wrong. Um, I'm, I'm thinking today I read in, in the newspaper about Credit Suisse who were hammered by, by uh, Swiss justice uh, because of their behavior in, in certain transactions. So that was certainly part of, of market abuse. And 
within the market abuse regulation you have this, this famous, um, let's say, legally interesting uh, concept of intent. So even if a transaction or something is intended to become a problem, you're already, as, as a financial firm, yeah, you're sort of obliged to be, to, to, to be on track on that. How you do that, nobody tells you. The, the, the legislation is quite vague about that. So that's interesting to, to tackle. I guess compliance and, and legal teams are still sweating about that. But then you also have some sort of self-imposed um, global code of conduct. I'm thinking about the, the FX global code of conduct. We have certain principles that, that also require you to behave in a certain way and to, to be able to manage those risks that, that we just talked about. So maybe if, if we can, I would say, Deep dive is, is, is a big word here, but we, we can touch upon what, what's going on there. I think that that would also be interesting, right? Yes, you touched, I think, the most important element, uh, which is transparency. Transparency is indeed the fil rouge of all the set of new regulations that we have been working with since the global financial crisis. It's all about traceability, it's all about monitoring, it's all about understanding concentrations of risk or detecting specific behaviors or patterns for the sake of creating a market, a financial market, which is safer, more robust, uh, and that can work effectively and with integrity. Now, we can tackle this from two angles, as you said correctly, right? On one side, we have the rules. On the other side, we have uh, the codes of conduct, normally industry codes of conduct. So there is technology and compliance on one side, but on the other side, there is a human factor, which cannot be neglected because humans are making the financial market. Now, if we start from the regulatory angle, uh, you mentioned MIFID II, which definitely introduced in line with this financial market transparency logic, a lot of requirements and obligations when it comes to transparency, pre and post trade. One uh, key element, as we all know, in MIFID II has been record-keeping obligation, Article 16.7, more specifically, requiring uh, investment firms to collect and retain and record-keep and keep a record of all the transactions and the relevant conversations attached to that for a specific and minimum amount of, of years. And more specifically, when it comes to the market evolving and adopting uh, more and new electronic communications channels, there is clear indication within MIFID II as part of the Q&A that was published a few years ago about how to deal and the importance to deal with electronic communication channels. There is a very clear list which includes emails, uh, obviously phone, um, uh, SMS, the good old facts is still there, but also chats and collaboration tools, video conferencing system. And not only that, uh, it's not just about archiving, but it's making sure that that uh, archive can then be searched easily and that integrity of the data can be maintained. If we look outside Europe uh, and we look at other jurisdictions and their regulations, the narrative is not so different, right? If we just mention a few uh, in, in the UK, the FCA Market Watch 66 published April 2021 really set some clear expectations on firms about recording phone conversations and all the conversations done on uh, electronic communication channels like uh, chats and collaboration platforms, especially when uh, specific working arrangements are in place. So with a clear reference to the hybrid working or the working from home environment that we all had to deal with with the pandemic. If we move to US, the scenario is not that different. There are similar rules uh, with FINRA, similar rules in Canada, in Asia. So the narrative is pretty consistent. The regulations are clear. And I think we all agree that it's common sense to archive, whether it is to comply with rules, uh, specific obligations, but also to be able, uh, from a trading desk point of view, to be able to reconstruct specific activities, specific workflows, whether it is because of a regulatory requirement or simply a customer request for clarity or to justify the so-called best execution. You also touched a very important element, which is the relevance of the industry codes of conduct, because it's important to remind that this market is done by humans. So the human factor 
the, the way we behave, our ethics are important. The objective of the industry codes of conduct, we all agree, is about creating you know, a, more, a market that can work more effectively and in line with a, an idea of in, integrity, right? Full integrity. Uh, the FX Global Code is definitely one of the most interesting pieces when we look about the scenarios of the industry codes of conduct. And if, as you know, we, that code is built around six leading principles. It's about ethics, governance, information sharing, execution, confirmation and settlement, and um, risk management and compliance. And the reason for me mentioning those six leading principles is that across each of those six leading principles, there is a reference to the importance of keeping a record and to be transparent and to guarantee that ability to reconstruct what happened for the sake of transparency. There is actually one principle in the Code of, in the code of Conduct, the Effects Global Code, which is Principle 23, which really sets the expectation for firms to, uh, first of all, define the perimeter, so the, the, the methods of communications allowed to be used in an organization but then also requires for record keeping to take place uh, with the ability to store, to archive, to search and to guarantee the security and the integrity of those data. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's, that's really, really interesting. Now, one thing that, I mean, we, we talked a lot about the framework, the, the, the risks, the challenges, everything going on around the actual topic. But I, I guess what, what, what members would also be interested in uh, is what, what are best practices that, that you see in the market? That, what, is there already sort of a trend that has been identified? I guess what, one of the best practices from, from what I hear uh, is that there needs to be a consistency in what you're doing. It's not a one-off shot. It's not with not doing sampling anymore. But this is really like, okay, this, there, there needs to be a solution that works for a lot of scenarios. Probably a one-size-fits-all solution is, is not a solution, but it needs to be tailor-made to specific situation all the time. I mean, that's, that's putting ends that are very far away from each other, trying to get them together. Um, well, what is something that, that, that you see in, in the market or that you've seen? Are there like mega trends? Uh, and then also, like, who, who are the stakeholders that, that need to be involved? Because there are different risks at different levels that, that need to be managed in, in terms of, of this specific topic. Yes, if we look at the market and, and the trends taking place when it comes to the so-called enterprise information archiving industry, uh, we can look at those trends from three angles. Technolog technological angle, the, um, the data angle, and to some extent the, the functional component of any solution that you want to deploy. From a technological angle, uh, what is relevant is to achieve a a situation where you can leverage a compliance solution that is able to cope with the amount of um, electronic communication channels that you need to store. So technologically it needs to be agnostic, needs to be open and needs to be able to allow you to store possibly in a fully hosted environment. Because let's not forget, if we need to go back and respond to an investigation, uh, the days of when we used to contact the IT team for them to download and burn a CD with the information are gone. Uh, compliance teams are working from home as well. So it's important that there is a solution in place and we're seeing a lot of this in the market that is fully hosted, agnostic, open and easy to be used. Obviously from a technological angle and putting together the technology bit with the compliance element being able to collect those sources of data in a native way is also important. There are many opportunities where this accumulation of data is actually done downloading from a specific platform or a data source and then uploading. And you would see this generates already a point of failure, a, a source of potential operational and compliance risk because we cannot guarantee what happened to data when downloading and then uploading into a different system. It's difficult to prove uh, nothing happened in between. From a functional data, when you start leveraging a, a solution, a compliant solution, which is across the enterprise and collects different data sources, the beauty of that solution 
is that you can leverage more data. You can put on the same timeline different data sources and really you're in a position to spot specific patterns. So the real advantage when it comes to the functional component of those solutions is to have the right analytics and the right artificial intelligence elements in order to detect those uh, patterns. And let's say move into again a new paradigm where we're not archiving for the sake of archiving or for reacting, but we are archiving because we're monitoring and we uh, start adopting a more predictive approach, starting to recognize patterns which are taking place in our organization so that internal policies can also be updated, technological solutions updated, and so achieving a better framework for the organization we work with. Right. I mean, that, that's, it's going to be a tough one for, for firms. And my guess is that if, if we look into the future as far as it's possible, I mean, in those times, nothing is certain anymore. But uh, that, let's try, nevertheless, to look a little bit into the future. Um, what, what would be sort of the, the, the factors that you would identify where that, that would push firms into, uh, into adapting, I guess, more innovative solutions? I guess we, we're right now still in, in the early days of, of this electronic communications monitoring. Um, I guess consistency, I, I've mentioned that before, you, you mentioned it as well. Consistency is going to be a key factor, finding those solutions that, that allow you to be as consistent as, as possible and as regular as possible, and then topping that off with, with innovative solutions that allow you to, to detect nuances in, in the communication. Uh, that, that would be sort of my take uh, from, from what you said, where the, the future is, is going to, to have to. Um, and then, yeah, I guess we, we, we can talk, I hesitated in the, I was a little bit hesitant in the beginning to use the term surveillance, but it sort of comes down to that. Not necessarily the, the, the bad side, the dark side of, of surveillance, but it, it's really in the interest of everyone to, to prove that in terms of, of your compliance, you you where you should be. I guess that that, that would also be a, a tough one to to communicate from from firms to the employees so that they understand what what is going on, right? And and then from there on, yeah. I mean the the future is going to to look a little bit uh, special in in that sense. Yes, indeed. If we look at the at the future of surveillance, as you mentioned, for electronic communications, definitely we can see uh, technology playing an increasing role into defining the best practice and the best solutions. Also because it's all about data. And, and, and so technology can help with additional computational power, with more analytics to detect those patterns and to spot patterns where technology could not um, achieve the same objective a few years ago. On the same topic of the future trends and where these can end up into, we should never forget uh, the human factor. So uh, we mentioned the industry, industry codes of conduct, the, the FACTS Global Code as one example. I think one of the most important investment organization needs to do besides technology and compliance solution or surveillance solution is internal policies and adherence to codes of conduct, continuous learning because it's only controlling at the very beginning of the process that we can try to uh, reduce at the minimum those operational conduct, compliance, and ultimately um, uh, reputational risks that we may bump into when, when running the activities of our organization. These trends are at the very base of what we have decided to do in Refinity a few years ago. Uh, revamping and energizing and investing more in a powerful relationship with Global Relay exactly to create a solution that could be agnostic, open, fully hosted and providing that set of analytics and advanced search capabilities that could better serve not only the compliance teams today but also in the coming future. Okay, cool. I mean, that, that's going to look bright in, in the future. I think this, this topic, we're, we're not nearly seeing the end of it, 
But we're at the end of, of this session, unfortunately. We, I guess we could, we could just carry on and, and talk another few hours about this. But uh, for the sake of, of this session, we're done. Thank you very much for listening in, watching in, however you did, you've done it. Um, and we're looking forward to see you on the next LFMA Spot and Forward. <laughs>